I'm Sham, I'm Project Officer for Consumer Engagement at Ants Data, and I'll be chairing the session today with uh, Ms. Nicole Scholes Robertson, Nikki, who presented beautifully yesterday uh, on her three minute thesis. Welcome, Nikki. And she's from Sydney School of Public Health, University of Sydney. There is a slight change in the program today as uh, Dr. Shilpa J. Sudhasan will be an apology for today's meeting due to unforeseen personal circumstances. And in her place, uh, Mr. Chris Forbes, the Chief Executive Office of Kidney Health Australia, will be giving a wonderful presentation on the activities of KHA with relation to the consumer engagement. And I would like to welcome Kelly Owen to give an acknowledgement and to the country and welcome to the country as well. Thank you. Morning, Sham. I'd like to acknowledge the lands that we meet on today is the traditional lands and waterways of the Gurna people. We pay our respect to the spiritual relationship and connection with our Yatarui. We acknowledge all First Nations people as custodians of the lands and welcome to the Gurna Yatarui. Our cultural and heritage beliefs and practices are still strong and important to all Gurna people. We take, pay deepest respects to our elders of the past that have paved the way, our elders currently holding the space, and our future leaders of tomorrow. When we tread on the Yarta land, I remind you to pause and think and remember all the First Nations people across the lands and seas. Nuliandu, welcome, Anununi, thank you all. Just reflecting on yesterday's session, I think uh, you all listened to Professor Jonathan Craig um, about his views on the beach security achievements over the last five years. And one of his favorite thing he said was the strong consumer voice shaping what we do in the future. So that shows the importance of this session. And also uh, the patient preferences for decision making was one of the implementation of beach security project and as Dr. Martin Howell presented, CARI got 100% of consumer involvement, which is really good. And that's what we want to look forward uh, moving in the research space. And also this highlights the new paradigm shift in the consumer research and how research is done in Australia. It underpins the saying, nothing about us without us. This is the reason why uh, this session is close to my heart because yesterday's session was all about big ideas and the big brains talked what they want to do. But today is all about emotions. You'll hear stories from consumers and their stories which are deeply, deeply emotional. So please understand our emotions. If you are a consumer and if it triggers any emotions or uh, any stressful events, just speak with your medical team. Few housekeeping stuff to go through. Uh, if you are an attendee, you will have very minimum facility. You can use the chat box to chat with the panelist. You can use the Q&A box to ask the questions and you can send your question anonymously as well. For summary audience, please use the mics provided by our wonderful team. The organizing team have gone to great lengths and you guys are so privileged to be here. So you can just use the mic to ask the questions. For speakers, once your presentation is over, please make sure you mute your microphone. With that, we'll continue the session today. Our first speaker is Mr. Chris Forbes. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Kidney Health Australia. Chris Forbes was appointed as CEO of Kidney Health Australia in October 2018. Chris has more than 20 years of executive and leadership experience across both commercial and not-for-profit industries, including agriculture, sport, ticketing venues, and entertainment. Chris is an accomplished and inspirational leader, experienced at growing organizations and ensuring they achieve their potential by building relationships with, while bringing staff, community leaders, and the commercial sector along on the journey. With the proven record in organizational transformation, Chris has taken up the task to find new ways to develop KHA's funding and resources, supporting the program and services that KHA provide, and to ensure the sustainability and growth of KHA. 
please join me in welcoming Mr. Chris Forbes. Thank you. Presentation is all the way from UK. It is uh, from Ms. Fiona Loud. It is a recorded presentation. So if you have any question, please uh, type on the Q&A box as usual and we'll get your answer by sending an email to Fiona. So Fiona is um, spent five years on dialysis after her kidneys failed before a transplant for, from her husband in 2006. Fiona is the policy director of Kidney Care UK, working with policymakers and others in campaigning for the organ donation opt-out law improving access to transplantation and patient choice. She, sets up the, she set up and chairs the UK Renal Registry Patient Council and been a member of many NICE kidney guideline groups. So NICE is the National Institute for Health Care and Excellence. And it's my privilege to uh, show what uh, Fiona has done uh, at UK Renal Registry because UK Renal Registry is very much patient focused and they're annual reports uh, are published uh, in a patient-friendly format as well. So uh, now I'm going to play a presentation from Ms. Fiona Loud. Thank you. The patient's Hello, today. My name is Fiona, Fiona Loud, and I am the policy director for Kidney Care UK. We're the UK Kidney Patient Support Charity, and I'm delighted today to be speaking to you at the Beats TKD Forum about people with kidney disease and how we can use our voices to work together to improve kidney care. Before I go into the talk itself, I'd just like to mention that I am also someone with kidney disease. I spent five years on dialysis and 13 and a half years ago, I was fortunate enough to receive a living transplant donation from my husband, Keith, which has kept me well up to now. So on to the talk. Every day in the UK, about 20 people will develop kidney failure. We have about 65,000 in total uh, on renal replacement therapy, and that's split with 35,000 being a transplant and about 30,000 on dialysis. So it's moved over the years to the default now being people, more people with transplants than on dialysis. But because every day people's kidneys keep failing, and every day some people didn't know they were going to fail in advance, and because standards of care the way in which we work together isn't perfect by any means. There is much, much more for us all to do. So we very much see that patients are partners to improving care. And I want to use the talk today to bring out some examples of impact of that, working with registries, a little bit about research as well. But first to the charity. So we were uh, founded, uh, founded just over 40 years ago now. We were originally called the British Kidney Patient Association. And very sadly, our founder, Mrs. Elizabeth Ward, died last week at the age of 93. It was her son that had kidney failure. So she lived a good and long life, setting up the first ever kidney donor card in, in our country. And her contribution is, is well recognized in the work that we do. She has such an amazing effect on kidney care overall. Many of us working for the charity are patients ourselves. We have a, a dozen advocacy officers who are often patients or patient families and they work, they're trained up and they work with, um, they're trained up employees and they work with patients giving insights, um, helping to get grants, um, supporting people on tribunals to get their employment benefits and so on and so forth. We have information, we have education, we have counselling and we give grants and we do a lot of campaigning and that's what I do. We also have, very importantly, a patient advisory group who works with us, they're volunteers, and they are our eyes and ears with things that are happening in different parts of the country. We've been very hurt by COVID-19, and I'll be reflecting a bit of that in my talk and on as well. 
The three things I'm going to particularly mention today will be the Kidney Patient Involvement Network, the working with the Renal Registry and the Patient Council there, and a little bit on work importing international guidance. We like to use our resources for the, for the best so that we can be evidence-based in our approach. So that when we advocate for things, we are doing them with our, our clinicians, with our healthcare professionals, um, and that we're doing that to reduce variation and increase and improve care that we have. And we work therefore within the community, with policymakers, with researchers, and we try to look into the future as well, because sometimes the smallest change can ripple out into, into something that's either much, much larger in, in its impact. And sometimes that's good and sometimes that's not so good. So on to, first of all, the Kidney Patient Involvement Network. So this is something that Kidney Care UK funds. It's for patients and clinicians, and it's something that's very, very much developing at the moment. And that's to put some resources together so that people who want to get involved in projects, want to do research, want to train up as patient, if you like, train up as patient leaders and want to do more research. So what are the things you should think about when you want to involve your patients in, in doing some of this work? And for patients, what would they want to think about know before getting into this? Should they, you know, what are the terms of reference? What are some of the things they might like to learn? So that's one thing that we've set up and I think it's, it's, it's got a lot of potential to improve, uh, improve the co-working. Next, I'd like to talk about the Renal Registry Patient Council. So we have a registry that's been around for a long, long time. Previously, it would report very clinical data, but it's latterly set up uh, a patient council, which uh, I was pleased to do a few years ago. And what we do is we advise on a whole range of things. So sometimes research proposals using data that's been collected from patients and is reported by our registry. Sometimes um, it can actually be reporting the, the regular uh, annual reports and that's just come out and sometimes it can be deeper than that we can look at things like should we be working with industry um, should the registry be using patient data in this way and so I'd like to think and I do believe it's so because we've carried on growing over the past few years that that has changed the way in which the registry works and has kind of opened up people to think of a, of a different way of working um, so one of the things that that is, has led us to show I suppose to show as well is that some of the the research that it does and some of the data that it reports on should be far more patient focused. So one of the key things that has been done has been some ethnicity data that has come out and that's regularly reported on now at the request of some of our members. Also uh, one of our members who sadly passed away now was very keen on better reporting about outcomes from different sorts of needling so for that, uh, we helped to recruit um, a, a fellow who researched that, a nursing fellow. She researched that work, reported back regularly to the council and has put some things in place to improve the way in which needling is done and the, the outputs and the standards for that in the country. So those are a couple of, of great examples, I think, there. working with the registry has helped to produce a patient reported experience work, which I'm going to cover shortly. But before I get into that, just like to show you a summary of the uh, the plain English or patient summary as, as some people call it and the kind of thing that goes into there so rather than the very detailed report we have a summary of some chapters that we've asked whether it's on um, dialysis and transplantation for young adults um, and um, different modes of dialysis you can get the idea from that from this little uh, overview summary so that's been great something else that we've done is this is an initiative of the charity alongside the renal registry is the PREM, so the patient reported experience measure. And those are the measures uh, which gather data on the experience of patients in healthcare settings. And it's done in the form of a questionnaire measuring our perceptions of experience while receiving renal care. It started as a pilot back in 2016 and from the, for the last three years it's run across all four UK countries and last year we had 16 and a half thousand people who took part which is uh, probably about a slightly under a third of all patients which is fairly significant just just the same we had to unfortunately postpone the survey this year but we've just announced we're going to do an online version of that survey which will 
probably not reach as many people, but will reflect some of the COVID uh, perceptions and experience that people have, because it's incredibly important that we pick that one up. So the questions in the organization are picked up jointly and it goes in, generally it goes in paper and online format. Now the survey itself was co-designed by patients, clinicians and researchers. So we're working with the universities, we're working with the researchers and the clinicians as well. And, the, and we have a patient group that works together with, with those other teams to develop and improve the questions as they go through each of the years. So we have 29, sorry, 39 questions and you can see for yourself the key themes around access to the team, support, communication, scheduling, the environment and so forth. And people rate that on a scale of 1 to 10. So the key findings from that, uh, that piece of work, that study, is that no matter where you're based, age, sex, ethnicity, state of disease, there were no significant difference in experience based on those characteristics. So the main thing that seemed to be impacting overall experience of kidney services is the kidney unit where people are treated. And the most highly rated areas of experience um, are privacy and dignity and access. So let's look at the three which are liberated and those are sharing decisions, so being able to share decisions between us, you know, pretty important to the way in which we experience our care, getting to and from dialysis and of course there's a big message there about more people having the choice to dialyse at home which I know is something that happens far more in Australia. Um, it's not, it's not such a well taken up option here, although I guess because of the coronavirus issues and the, the, the less chance of, of getting coronavirus if you die those at home, that, could, that would be and should be a good learning from experience this year. And needling as well. So that has been something that has been consistent year on year. So we have a call to action with our community, with patients themselves, to look at what can be done about each of these three things. And it's not simple, we're asking people to make, to make a plan. And had we not had coronavirus now, there was going to be a great deal more work between ourselves and encouraging them. We put a bunch of tools together to help people to look at what's happening in their own units and to work together to improve that. So uh, you can review how your own centre is going by looking against the national average and you won't be able to read that but that thing on the left hand side there is lots and lots of different units and you can see there's quite a range of experience there. And this one is kind of the overall experience about how well you would grade your experience because if you think most of your life when you're on dialysis you, an awful lot of it you're in the unit, you're on, it, you're on treatment uh, so it's pretty important that people would understand and learn from what is going on there locally. So I've summarised up, we've summarised up the national results here um, and you'll be able to see that overall experience, if it's rated up to seven, it's, it's rated quite high actually, but nevertheless, um, it's still, we still see that, that opportunity for improvement and the variation between different parts of the country. And we've compared the mean scores by theme year to year. And what you'll see is there's not actually a great deal of difference from year to year. And that's probably, and that is definitely why this year was going to be the one to pick up and, and, and try and get some further movement on that. Because there's one thing asking people, but keeping getting the same answer year after year is not that encouraging to patients. So when you do a piece of work, research uh, uh, feedback to, back to people, but also look at what we can do to improve. And you can actually look into your local results in more detail by this new interactive facility that's there on the uh, renal registry portal, which is a good one. And finally here, and we, um, we've asked everybody to share their experience using Kidney Prem and that's, as you'll have gathered, an ongoing piece of work. Now I'd like to move on now and cover a couple of other things in the time I've got available. So one is about uh, inputting into national guidance we have uh, something called NICE here, the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence. And we do put forward patients, or I myself take part in some various technology appraisals which look at all sorts of research. And we work with our, a lot of our, our clinicians, health economists, and so on and so forth. And I wanted just to share a few tips and learnings from that as well. So um, 
getting patient representatives can be difficult on some of these things. So when you, that's really what CAPIN is about, the Kidney Patient Involvement Network I mentioned earlier. Helping people to understand what opportunities are available and offering being open with the support you've got for them. Trying not to do too much on the way of paperwork and process if you can possibly avoid it. So make it as easy as possible. Put yourself in the, you know, in the, foot, in the, the shoes of the consumer. Also remember people's health state, it does change. And sadly, a lot of people that we work with, as you'll already gather, you know, do pass away and their health state changes. But actually help to give people confidence because what they do, what you do as a patient can be incredibly impactful. And I've seen that in some of these technology appraisals. It's not everybody's cup of tea to work on a technology appraisal, but there are other ways in which people can help too. So I'm just going to give you one uh, example of that. We have something called Kidney Kitchen, a place where you can go and get dietary inspiration. You know, kidney failure, <sighs> diet is challenging, isn't it? Especially for those, for those on dialysis. So we put, we put some things together here and some lovely YouTube recipes and it's worked with the dietitians. So when we did that, we thought, well, that's great. That's marvelous. But actually, what does that, how does that link up with guidance? So our colleagues at the National Institute who work on the guidance said to us, well, you know, you've got this kidney kitchen. How does that work with, um, the, with the dietary, you know, the, diet, the national dietary guidance about phosphates and, phosph uh, um, and potassium and so on and so forth? And we thought, you know what, actually there is a link there. So my colleague Deborah wrote this blog here with NICE and it's actually picking up some new, some new guidance that came out last year. Uh, and she was reflecting on her own experience where she was a both kidney and pancreas uh, recipient and how little she could eat then and what she could eat now and what was the thinking behind our kidney kitchen there around the, uh, the different you know, dietary restrictions. So a little bit about what, can, what you can do rather than what you can't do. And that was a great example of, of being able to put kind of research guidance and practice into place. Now, as I come to the end of my talk, I did want to touch on COVID-19. We did a piece of research ourselves and we, we asked our patients how they'd been experiencing COVID. We did this in May 2020 and we had about 1,200 patients responding. Many of those patients reported a mental health impact. Even more of them reported disruption to care and significantly a lot reported worries about getting access to food as well, which, is, which was something that we heard a lot about from patients. And so sometimes, you know, when you're in the middle of something that's never happened before, like a pandemic, there are new things to learn. And we are using this work we've done ourselves with our patients to inspire our commissioners to rebuild and restart, um, if they possibly can, because the pandemic isn't over yet, but to restart access to renal services and using that fact about what, what more mental health support can be put in place, for example. So what we've also done alongside that is we've put um, a research page in place so more people can get involved with, uh, with COVID research if they wish to do so, as well as, as well as linking that straight into the survey. So finally, I'd just like to summarize up that there are, there's a great deal of work that's been going on in our country around working with research working with registries and what we have found in the main is that by working together we can do more online because we have to do that but we still should reach out offline and that by re rebuilding confidence is is vital rebuilding our services is vital and that we should do and one of the ways in which we can do that is by reflecting and learning together and finally if you're on twitter and this works if you put in hashtag distance aware something something fun might happen by the time you listen to this talk but if you don't here's our new social distancing symbol we've got in the UK which is going all over the place so it's not just us but it's to remind people to keep their distance because the pandemic is by no means over. Thank you very much for listening to me and for the invitation. Thank you. Thanks Fiona, that was a great presentation and I would encourage the attendees to type that question and ask on the Q&A box and we'll track those and then send it to Fiona for answers. Thank you. I'm gonna hand over to Nikki to introduce our next speaker. Thanks.
Hi everyone, I'm very excited to uh, welcome Kelly Owen who has done a fantastic uh, job with Welcome to Country at the start. But um, I'm very much looking forward to listening to her talk on changes in consumer engagement for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, and learning a bit more about her work that she does there. I think um, I was very excited to find out about her first-hand knowledge of kidney transplant journey but also that her background in with a Bachelor of Education and Master of Indigenous Language degrees um, I can't wait to hear more about your talk. Um, welcome again, Kelly. Thank you for, for being a part of today. Hi, can everybody hear me? Just making sure audio and visual. Awesome, thank you. Nanawi Michi, Kelly Ari Owen. Napi Lewin Pombrook, Napi Naturtu Tadanyanga. Namawi Ninkawi Turni Pula, Asham, Jarian, Isaiah, Takari, Karani, Motha Yamalai, Jarian Jr. Nomawi Lakalinyari, Owen, Edwards, May, Adams, Kranatu, Kopinyari, Armstrong, Kanawi. Nomawi Pakunu, Garna, Naranga, Motha Naranjeri. Nomawi Nangai, Ted Tidswell, Nomawi Ninkawi, Julie Owen. Marduwi Motha, Nacho Lakalinyari, Tumeni, Anununi. My name is Kelly Owen. I live in Murray Bridge and my birthplace is Adelaide. I'm a mum to five children, Asham, Jarian, Isaiah, Takari and Karani, and Mutha, Nana, to one, Jarian Jr. My blood family lines are Owen, Edwards, May, Adams, Kronaru, Kopinyari, Armstrong and Kanawi. My grandfather is Ghana and Naranga, my Nana is Narangiri. My dad is Ted Tidswell, my mother is Julie Owen. I'm a mum, Mutha, wife, sister, auntie, friend and family member to many. What is NIT? So we're the National Indigenous Kidney Transplantation Task Force. I um, get a lot of questions of what is the need to have uh, a task force? Well, there was a TSANZ report that came out and there were 35 different recommendations. From those recommendations, Minister Ken Wyatt granted $2.3 million in funding to address this. So Nick focuses on three key areas. One was establishing a National Indigenous Kidney Transplantation Task Force, enhancing data collection and, and reporting, as well as improving equity and accessibility of transplantation. The task force and secretariat, it's up and running, and our main aims now are to enhance our data collection and reporting. So there's a 12 month pilot project to capture additional pre post kidney transplant data points in the ANZ data um, collection protocol. The third key area is the equity and access to transplantation. We're establishing Indigenous reference groups at five national transplant units to help design pathways and models of care that are culturally appropriate. We're trialling patient navigators as part of pre-transplant care protocols and we're undergoing a cultural bias literacy review of the health system that will produce an accompanying policy docu document back to government. So who are we? So these are the task force members that um, attended the conference in Alice Springs. We have an operations committee and underneath that we have five hard working group members, uh, sorry, working groups. The first one's our community engagement. Second is data. Third is the cultural bias review. Four is the pre-transplant coordination. And our fifth one is our patient mentors. Within the Secretariat, we're uh, based in the Samri building, but we're situated within the ANZ data office area. Our executive offer is Eleanor Gerard, and our administrative officer is Matilda Antoni. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator. I've taken 12 months leave from my teaching position uh, to step into this space with lived experience. Our projects are overseeing the many projects that we have underway. So how's it being done? 
through community consultation with First Nations people who are living with CKD and also their families. We visit on country, we're meeting families, and we're having a sneak peek of cultural responsibilities from their area. These face-to-face -face meetings were possible prior to the COVID. We're opening up communica communication pathways to respectfully listen, record and report back on. This approach is empowering our people to advocate and build on the health literacy within their own journey. We're building respectful relationships with our people and their families in the process to address equity and access. We're collaborating with Kidney Health Australia and being part of the yarning sessions. I was actually privileged to be at one in Lismore earlier this year and also involvement with the action group in um, Adelaide, which I'm a member of. We're doing community visits in Darwin, Catherine and Perth have also taken place this year. The national uh, projects that are underway across four states and territories through sponsorships. We focused on the transplantations, patient mentors and establishing these five reference groups. A cultural bias review is being undertaken to inform policy documents and address these. So the sponsorship program um, was announced and 1.04 million was um, offered to eight different sponsors. The next slide will just be an outline of the projects and who um, benefited from this money. So as you can see, they, um, they range across Australia, in delivery on outreach of kidney transplant education and assessment in rural and remote areas establishing a transplant focused patient mentor pilot projects and indigenous reference groups and strengthening the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workforce in kidney transplant settings. The indigenous reference groups um, have been set up at five national hospitals which are Royal Prince Alfred and Westmead in New South Wales, the Princess Alexandra in Queensland, to Charles Gardner in Western Australia and the Royal Adelaide in um, South Australia. So the purpose was to create a sustainable transplant response change cycle within the unit and it was directly feeding back to the Indigenous Reference Group members and this is repeated back then to the transplant unit. So my methodology is actually a work in progress uh, as this hadn't been done before in the kidney space but we actually have our first IRG meeting, which is scheduled in late September in WA. We've developed the process between the transplant team, the Aboriginal health practitioners and myself, where I contact the member via phone and start building the relationship and listening to their journey. I unpack their issues with the phone calls and produce a table to present at our first meeting to members to which we can address. So during this process, we cover a terms of reference, which is tweaked to each hospital and to their local contacts. We've had lots of yarning happening across these hospitals with patients. The next slide looks at um, the flow chart of how this is happening. So we've got on our left, the key stakeholders that are all working together. And then within the middle, you have the transplant unit uh, reference group and the transplant unit management meetings. So in the green, the middle green um, circle, I'm working with the actual members, the Indigenous liaison or Aboriginal health practitioners within the hospital and transplant coordinators. We bring all that information together um, and we develop a report and we're trying to align it with their reconciliation action plan within the hospital. And then we present it back to the transplant unit management meetings. And ultimately, we're looking for a transplant unit response. So we want a change in policy and practice to support better outcomes, so better transplant outcomes for First Nations people. We also have a national member panel. Uh, a lot of people are asking why, why, why have we got an actual panel set up? Well, it's to shine a light on the health services that don't deliver culturally appropriate care to help educate staff and give solutions focusing on equity and access to transplantation amongst our people. So the purpose is to have state representatives within each jurisdiction to advocate and voice their issues to address and let's solve it together. 
Here's a distribution of our panel members. This was back in uh, March. Since then, we've grown to 68 members across Australia. We have uh, the hunting team on the top photo, um, and the bottom one was down in Catherine. So the hunting team's in Darwin, and these were the first community engagement meetings that I was having before COVID hit. We work very closely with Kidney Health Australia. And like I said previously, I had uh, the privilege of being a part of the one at the Lismore yarning session. So currently the Australian New Zealand guidelines that are used by doctors and nurses and the health professionals to treat kidney disease don't include cultural aspects of care or specific needs and challenges that are faced by our people. By consulting with community by ways of the yarning sessions on country with community, we're able to gain important insight of how these guidelines should be written and how they should be used. The focus was improving kidney care, which was voiced by our people. So there were actually 16 communities that participated in a culturally safe space and openly yarned about their kidney journey, their experiences with the kidney treatment for themselves and also their families. I'm also a member of um, ACTION in Adelaide. So ACTION stands for Aboriginal Kidney Care Together Improving Actions Now. So our aim is to identify and respond to the needs of Aboriginal kidney patients and their families living within the South Australian area. And we're a deadly group of Aboriginal patients and families, families focusing on better kidney care and improving the outcomes now, not just talking about it. And we're all great support for one another. Here's a, a group photo. So obviously the need was evident and, and through an MRFF funding grant, the action research team was established and then the action reference group. So again, um, we're a group of Aboriginal people with lived experience of CKD, whether we're on dialysis, uh, if we're on the active list, post-transplant and members. And we also have included our members, uh, family members that are representatives for ones that we've lost. Our community yarning sessions are addressing social determinants and strategies to move forward and to keep our spirits strong. We're focusing on patient journey mapping to unpack complex paths and identify the barriers that we face from remote, rural and metro areas. Here's a, a bit of a, a chart of who we're actually working with um, from community to the University of Adelaide, within SAMRI, the Chronic Kidney Consortium, Aboriginal Health Services, Kidney Health Australia, and also Purple House. So the reference group covers our community consult consultations, the journey mapping, and then we break down and focus on what's happening within the community. We're looking at finding, uh, analysing that information and coming up with findings and recommendations, ultimately to help KHA CARI um, guidelines. The importance of community voices and listening. I can't stress um, enough how vital it is to include our people's voices and our experiences to change the national kidney care space. We need to respectfully address our hard issues that we face and help us work through the barriers. We need to consistently work together to find solutions to improve the data, which tells us there are major issues that we must solve. Anonuni, thank you all. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was fantastic. Um, I was just going to see if there's any questions out there at the moment, but I, I just want to make one comment is that I met some beautiful people from Kempsey, which is down the road uh, for where I live in Armadale, and, and two of them had um, gone up to Lismore to attend the Yarning Circle, and it was their first time being involved, um, and they came away from that um, with very changed um, perspectives on um, providing treatment of care to the dialysis unit where they were working in um, in um, Kempsey at that stage. So, yeah, um, I think we have one more. Oh no, just a thank you from Martin Martin Howe. So, 
if there's any other questions, oh, here we go. Um, Martin was asking if there is security of funding for the advisory board, Kelly. Not that I'm uh, um, aware of, Martin. Um, I think it's an ongoing round of grants. Uh, I know that we didn't get extra funding um, from the Commonwealth that we'd requested, but I know that's happening across the board with everybody. Thank you so much. Um, if there's no further questions, I'll hand over to uh, Sham. Thanks, Nikki. So we'll move on and uh, we'll introduce the next speaker. And Nikki is going to present um, our next. And it's about overview of beat CKD consumer engagement. In 2014, Nikki commenced dialysis and was fortunate to receive a living kidney donor, uh, living donor kidney transplant from her brother. Nikki has given several invited presentations, including the one at Global Health Policy Forum at the World Congress on Nephrology, uh, on quality, sustainability, and equity of care, a patient's perspective. Nikki is also a chair of the Beach CKD Consumer Advisory Board, and is a steering group member of the Standard Outcomes in Nephrology Song Gene Initiative, which aims to develop core outcomes for people living with glomerular disease. Uh, without further ado, let's welcome Nikki. Thank you. Thanks, Sham. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting it off uh, off presenter view for some reason. It does not want to go. But um, yeah, thank you so much for having me speak today. And and I guess I I wanted to acknowledge um, country and um, I acknowledge the traditional owners of this area. And I'm on Anawan land at the current time, and I pay my respects to the elders, past, um, present, and emerging. So it's, um, it's been a very interesting couple of years. I think it's 23 months since this photo was taken. Um, and for me, I kind of really didn't um, have any clue of uh, what I was getting in for when I arrived in Sydney in September for the first Beat CKD forum on a Sunday afternoon um, at the beautiful Darling Harbour. Um, I'd answered an expression of in interest on a KHA website um, post on Facebook about being involved in research and up until that time I hadn't really had a lot of input or a lot of access to do stuff and my background had more been about my personal journey but also running a support group for um, between 20 to 30 uh, other people with kidney disease of various, in various uh, stages in, an, in a small country town or city where I live, it's only tiny. Um, so attending that first um, Beat CKD forum um, was, was quite life-changing for me but also the thing that I find interesting now is looking back on this photo and just reflecting that I knew no one when I walked into that room. I actually had not met any of them um, and I, I kind of uh, now know so many people it's, it's been quite interesting. I think then from the, the start of the um, having our first forum there was some expression of interest across the four different pillars for people to get involved in at different levels and today I'm going to do a little bit of a focus on um, AKTN and Cochrane Kidney and Transplant. Kari Chandana is going to give us a little bit of a talk a bit later on uh, and Sham will do the same for Arms Data. And I think it's exciting to note that last year at, um, at the Beat CKD Forum, um, another patient attended who's also a PhD researcher, Brooke, and she um, she's now starting to do some work with, with us and um, through Centre for Kidney Research, but also TSA and Z looking at um, telehealth and transplant patients, particularly in this COVID era. So it's been interesting that the consumer involvement has come about in, in quite a few different ways. I think this is a slide that was shared um, by, by Stephen yesterday, some of it, but I think this um, really encompasses some of the great um, meetings and forums. And I think to acknowledge the amount of work that was put into getting um, these together was, in, was incredible. I, I really enjoyed um, attending. I'm sorry that I'm in the photos, but um, other than that, it was fantastic for us, uh, for me to go along and hear speakers on those first days. And I'd never met Amber who co-chaired with Stephen in the first session. And it was just fantastic to hear of her story and, and to hear other people actually talking about the issues and, and really how those issues had impacted 
with their life and, and I guess what the needs were. And I hadn't ever actually been in a situation where I'd heard people share at that kind of level, but also wanting to make things better. And I think underpinning all our consumer involvement is really that we want to make things better for, for those, um, for other people who are, who are on this journey of um, chronic kidney disease. I think it's really um, fantastic to say too that some great journal articles have been published um, following these experiences and, and a massive thank you must go to Emily Duncanson who I know is about to go on maternity leave but Emily your work underpinning um, and, and Charlie Goodman um, as well in these has really um, helped us valuably and you guided us and provided us an amazing amount of support and I must say a huge thank you um, for all that you did. Thank you so much. I just wanted to go on um, and talk a little bit about AKT and I've kind of been working with AKT and now for about 18 months, I think across a few different levels. And some of these studies are not uh, ones that I'm personally involved in, but what we wanted to do was highlight the different degrees of consumer involvement across um, some of the different studies, but, but also a bit of a reflection from um, some of the investigators or chief investigators on these projects as to how they felt the consumer involvement had actually uh, impacted them or impacted the study. And I guess um, two of the earlier ones that had consumer involvement was Pisces. I'm not going to go into the uh, scientific uh, background about the study. I'm more focusing today on, on the consumer involvement and what happened and, and how that worked. So, I mean, with Pisces, it was looking, um, the consumers were, had been involved in preparing the information and in including newsletters um, sent after recruitment targets were made. And I think it's been fantastic seeing um, in a lot of the presentations as we've gone along the, the use of the um, consumer friendly information guide as to what's come out has certainly been a fantastic um, moving forward. Teach PD, uh, and, um, which is in cooperation with the Home Network and also Kidney Tri AKT, and um, it was wonderful to meet the very passionate jo Josephine Chow, but also to meet the lovely consumer who's been working with them throughout the whole life cycle and is a very um, marked part of decision making and how things go forward in this trial. And I think Neil sums it up really, really well, um, particularly with the last line we cannot move away from consumer involvement, and indeed we need to enhance it even more. Um, and that's fantastic to see people um, heading in this direction. We heard a little bit about the Best Fluids program from um, yesterday, um, but I think from a consumer involvement point of view, it was it was um, involved um, patients um, participants reviewing information sheets, involvement in the consenting forms, and recommending improvements to do that. And anybody who's been involved in the consenting process for a clinical trial knows that it can sometimes be quite complicated and sometimes um, presented in a way that is uh, not at all uh, easy to understand. So this is a great body of work that people have been doing, actually making these more understandable and more usable um, and I think um, that's that's a great assist going forward and it certainly must have an impact I'm not sure of the data but certainly must have an, an impact on um, our ability to actually sign people up and actually uh, recruit people to trials. Um, I think to um, the consumer input was going to be uh, will be sought for the design of the trial results summary and also get anything to do with facing pa uh, patient facing documents, and that um, really patients do have a, a role and consumers have a huge role in actually disseminating the information of any of the trial results summaries as we'll see. I think um, Michael Collins, who's the lead uh, investigator on this one, though, I, I liked his comment down the bottom, which says it shows respect for the very people that we are trying to improve outcomes for through our research by ensuring they know how their contribution to the study can or did make a difference. And I think this is really important that it's really important any consumer involvement that is had is that there is feedback from the investigating team as to how that changed and how that modified and how that assisted with that study going forward. CKD fix and we heard a bit about this um, yesterday um, from David and um, this the results here were fantastic and and how that was uh, was put in a um, in a great infographic was was really well done and I think the plain English trial results summary was great um, and also it was really important kidney health New Zealand consumer reps were involved in this and a lot of our work is is very much Australia and New Zealand and and I mean one of the points I'll expand on is is around 
find that we do need to have more um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander input into these these trials and the clinical trials going forward. But that also goes for um, the Maori people and also the Pacific Islander, who we know are quite a large population within Kidney Health um, New Zealand. So I think that's certainly one place we do need to go. Um, and David said there that um, the consumer engagement was pivotal to its success, um, with, uh, particularly around the areas of communicating. So, yeah. Valid, we had a little bit about this study yesterday from Andrea Viatelli, and, and I think um, Andrea has been fantastic to work with, and I've had not particularly on this trial, but other trials, and um, has been very aware of consumer involvement and, and working with us very closely on different things. And I think the Valid study um, idea was the result of Song, which is all about consumer engagement and, and talking to consumers, but also caregivers. So it's really important that caregivers also have a part in all these things to say. Um, and in this too, there are two consumers who are on the trial steering committee as well. Um, and I think for Andrea, she does um, have here with by inviting patients to share what they feel are important health outcomes. We are able to design impactful studies that are ultimately address what is relevant to both patients and their treating healthcare professionals. We are in a in a um, relationship where it's really about a balancing act of our priorities um, so that we can have the best outcomes. NavKids 2 um, has had quite a phenomenal amount of consumer involvement in it and um, this is a, a great study which was talked a little bit about yesterday but I think um, there's been significant consumer involvement um, involved in the document present preparation and information sheets and the study will continue to seek consumer involvement but I think this one particularly Chandana has had a huge uh, role in this and, and we'll be hearing more about from her about um, Kari, but I think Chandana's work with recruitment and um, meeting with families to sign them up um, to be involved in the NAD Kids too has been quite crucial and critical um, in actually recruiting um, patients. She's um, in the front line with Rabia, actually working closely with these families, sharing her story. And I think sharing our stories is very powerful with people who, um, if they're unsure as to what this trial might be about, but um, and Chandana's um, understanding and, and her need that she at times would have found uh, having the patient navigator for her and her daughter navigator getting through this through the um, services they need um, is vital to recruitment in this study. Um, excuse the photo of my face in this one. I wanted to put the MFIT across there, but MFIT's been very exciting. It's um, come out of the song uh, as well, but it's looking at a um, mobile exercise app to improve um, fatigue in patients on dialysis. And this was a core outcome from the, from the song um, HD. I think the interesting thing here was that it's had an MRF um, successful grant and there was one consumer CI and one AI and the AI was Indigenous and I think um, it's really important um, going forward that this will be a big change going forward. Um, I think that the exciting thing that this has had consumer involvement the whole way through and will continue to do so. The GOAL trial, um, this is uh, a, a new study that at the moment that we've been working on. Um, at the moment, there's been active uh, consumer engagement. And the exciting thing about GOAL is that this is not just with nephrologists that we've been working on the nephrology research community. This has actually been working across geriatricians as well. And those people that we've been uh, working with, they haven't actually had a lot of experience with working with consumer, having consumers involved in the research process. So it's been a very big learning curve for them. Um, and also those of us on it. I think um, at the moment um, there is act definitely active, um, we had a meeting this morning across all st um, stages of the trial design um, from design to dissemination. Um, there was an associate investigator on the grant application. There's two representatives on the trial steering committee and yesterday we were talking about the real need for rural and remote people to be involved and it's really exciting to say that two of those people are rural um, and I think too um, that there can, there's a consumer advisory board um, that's being formed and all patient documents and um, basically looking at translation of any results and moving forward and first job will be forming the consumer advisory board and training and onboarding 
but also um, we'll be looking at the ethics uh, documents and, and providing feedback on that. And I think Professor Ruth Hubbard is um, a geriatrician and she has learnt, she has quoted here as saying that she's learnt such a lot from consumers in our team. Um, they've offered insights which have may have been of which have been of practical help, such as preferred methods to record hospital appointments. Um, and it's easy to get lost in the intricacies of protocol development um, and the challenges of study implementation, but answering consumers' questions always makes me reflect on the fundamental reasons why we're undertaking the study. And I think that's really important that consumers have a way of bringing people back to what's important. So in summary about AKT, and I just wanted to say that um, we're at the moment currently developing a lot of resources for across trials that will be modifiable for all trials, looking at consumer involvement in terms of references. We're developing new, new policies um, for consumers um, within AKTN, um, and this looks at things like social media policy, financial reinvestment, um, a confidentiality agreement, which was uh, quite an interesting one. Donna, there was a confidentiality agreement that the University of Queensland wanted us to use and I couldn't understand it at all. Um, so Donna has uh, been negotiating um, quite significantly with the legal department so that we could actually get a confidentiality agreement that was fit for purpose and not completely overwhelming of the consumers at, at that time. Um, there's another trial which is um, beat calcium, which is looking at calciphylaxis in dialysis patients, which is quite a rare complication, and, and they have a con consumer group on board uh, really early. There's training plans for education for clinical trials and development of resources for those specific trials so that um, the consumers coming on board will actually have some education ready to go so they can understand more about the trials and um, therefore making them more able to contribute. Um, consumer input in c clinical trials will be at every stage of the research cycle. And I, I think Goal, MFI and NAVKIDS will be really much the standard going forward um, for consumer involvement in trials at, at um, AKTN. And I think the other thing to notice, and I know Vanessa's on here as well, who's um, on the scientific committee, is that they increased um, one position on the scientific commission to two um, to, to actually acknowledge and, and increase the number of consumers at that level. It's, it's been my absolute pleasure in the last uh, month or two to start doing some work with consumer um, kidney and a Cochrane kidney and transplant. And um, my head has been trying to get my way around uh, all the resources that Cochrane Consumer and Con Communication has the most amazing amount of resources and training visios and information ready to go. Um, it certainly has a lot already in place, which in other pillars, we don't have that, but Cochrane um, actually has a lot of that in place. Orientating consumers is a matter of joining up as a consumer member and providing the links to the relevant and most appropriate material that consumers would need at that time. Basically, the, the processes within Cochrane really make it very straightforward for consumer involvement to be embedded in those processes to make it sustainable. And certainly from my experience with some of the other pillars is we've, we've been doing the consumer involvement, but we haven't actually necessarily had the processes. So we're going to have to, because we, we were unsure as to how it go to, about it to a degree, we were learning as we went. So now we're going back and doing the processes. But the good thing with Cochrane is those processes are there and it's very um, stable and very, and I like processes, I really quite, find it easy to work with. And I think at the line that was in some of the Cochrane stuff was involving stakeholders is invaluable ensuring that Cochrane evidence is relevant to the people who need it most. And this is around priority setting and that's certainly where we'll be heading with Cochrane Kidney and Transplant. We'll be looking at a survey that will help to devise what are the priorities of um, consumers out there, what do they want to know and what Cochrane uh, reviews are going to be important for them. Plain language summaries within Cochrane Kidney Transplant are fantastic. They are just perfectly suited um, for consumer involvement. They are a great place to start. Um, they're a part of every Cochrane review. They're currently done by reviewers, but ideally they suit consumer involvement. So this is the first place we're going to start. Um, there's a guide and a format as to how to go about it and the training's already um, available. It's just pretty much um, working out where we fit in the process. And that's something Tess Nurell and I are currently working on is, is embedding that um, review into uh, the process. 
And the other thing is we need to get it out there to consumers, the plain language summary out on um, social media and patients more aware of it because it is such valuable information um, to use. And the exciting thing for me coming up is that I'm going to be a reviewer for the first time in a Cochrane review. So I'm actually just learning all these processes and I really love learning about all the different ways we can do it. So for me, some of the highlights from the last uh, 23 months have been um, following on from meeting all these amazing people. Um, we, there was a focus group about words used in kidney disease that was held internationally, but actually two of the focus groups came to Armadale. And these beautiful people here, um, uh, some of our, my kidney brothers and sisters in Armadale. Um, and the exciting thing for them, for me, is in this picture, there's other than me, um, are three consumers who are now across um, different, are involved in research, getting more involved in research as we go. The lovely lady here, Janet Bailey in the wheelchair, um, is coming on the goal trial um, as part of the steering com um, committee and also co-chair of the consumer advisory board. Um, and her insight has been invaluable. Um, she's on hemodialysis and in a wheelchair, lives alone and um, is, is invaluable in, in the information she has to share. Um, Cass here, who was in Armadale, but has moved, unfortunately for us in Armadale, but she's moved up to Brisbane. Um, Cass is involved in MFIT um, and, and also looking at coming on board a few other things to assist us there. And then down here, big, big stretch, we call him, Richard at the back is actually going to be part of um, Song. Um, and he's going on the PKD, there's uh, looking at pain uh, in PKD patients. Um, and Richard's um, going to be involved in some of that. So for me, the really highlighting part of being able to be involved in research for me has, has actually been more exciting to the flow on effect to be able to in, encourage others to come in. One of the highlights for me is certainly meeting new people across the and many across the world. And for me, sustainable consumer involvement relies heavily on building relationships and communication. And that for us to, to gather more people and to encourage more people, it's really around us building those relationships and setting those foundations. I think for me too, one of the highlights of uh, being part of all this has been getting an opportunity to learn and study. It's certainly not the path every consumer would take to kind of step in to go and do a PhD, but for me, that's just been perfect timing and it's just been amazing to have this opportunity. I've loved learning all things quality research, qualitative research, health economics, guidelines, Cochrane and clinical trials, and I've got plenty more to learn. Um, Amando will always tell me I have lots to learn about quantitative research. So I'm looking forward to that, but maybe not in the next couple of years. Um, I've really loved working with and learning a lot about so many amazing consumers, cl clinicians and researchers. And I guess for me, one of the highlights too is gaining my new buddy. And um, I'd really just like to thank Talia Gutman for everything. Um, she's my, my support, my buddy, and particularly in the early days when uh, I was very unsure as to what I was doing, Talia was certainly uh, my rock and steadying influence in all that I did. Quickly, just where to from here, I guess it's really about developing pathways for consumers and there's no one right, what right way. We need to focus on building relationships, communication, trust, and not all consumers' journeys will be the same. Not everybody's going to be like me or Sham. Um, people, we need to work with people where they're at and find different pathways that we can actually get them involved at the level that they want to be involved in, but also how we can sustain that involvement so that we're communicating and we're actually learning as we go in and improving things as we can. The National Strategic Action Plan will certainly help facilitate that with the funding going across the four pillars to look at embedding um, and really building our consumer involvement and the base that we have. Um, I think it's vital that we share resources and learnings. We don't uh, reinvent things that are already done in other areas. And I'm really looking forward to this. And Sharma and I have already started doing that across the different pillars. I think it's important. We have three, um, three of us in paid positions um, working across the board. But I think, you know, we will be, our focus will be on onboarding others and also the processes. We'll be very much looking at that. And I think it's important to remember that all grants going forward need to be uh, looking at having consumer involvement as, as a CI or an AI presence um, and, and how we go about that. And I just want to say a huge thank you, particularly to the CIs of BEAT CKD. Um, thank you so much for all the support, encouragement, um, and really to all the staff. And the, the photos of the people around uh, this one have been the one who have um, very much been the faces that have supported us um, throughout our journey with BEAT CKD.
So thank you very much. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, I know how hard it is for you to present all your amazing work in the 15 minutes you've had, but uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Let's look at some questions. Uh, Nicola from, um, from clinical trials said such an exemplar work and all prices for you, Nikki, <laughs> and the team. I, th I, I think there's a little bit about the culturally and linguistically diverse groups. And I think, Nicola, that's um, certainly one of the areas we need to head forward. And, and I think it is around relationships, um, certainly for me, in the background to this, I've been working with probably three or four consumers um, and um, two of whom are Indigenous and both building confidence and, and skills and, and, and actually trying to do that. But I think it's really about relationship building and, and finding people who might be able to come on that we could work with and buddy up. Like I needed somebody to, to buddy me and to help me along initially. Um, I think we need to then, those of us who are lucky enough to be um, doing this need to become buddies and work out ways that we can engage um, more strategically I guess with these people but people like Kelly Owen uh, um, whose talk was just amazing previously are, are key to this they, they have more insight than I do into it as well. So there is a question from Nicola she asked uh, could you talk about any initiatives or approaches you have undertaken to ensure more people from culturally and linguistic, linguistic backgrounds can be involved? Yeah, so I think just what I've said before, but um, I think it needs to be our priority going forward. Um, and I think it's also about socioeconomic status and it's also about educational status. We need to be working with people um, from all areas and that we don't, we don't want to become uh, generic. And I think the other thing that we, we can have a tendency to be is that, you know, it's easier for us as transplant patients to be involved because we have more time and we're not connected to dialysis machines. So we do need to be aware and encourage um, those who are on dialysis and Janet's on hemodialysis. So working around, um, sometimes we have to be flexible around their um, schedules. Thank you. If there are no questions, let's thank Nikki once again. And I would encourage audience to tweet using the hashtag uh, BeatCKD Forum 20. Thank you. So now we're going to be going on to our next session, which is about consumers who have been embedded within the Beat CKD and getting them to tell some of their stories. So the first person is Sham. Um, so Sham's recently commenced as the project officer um, for consumer engagement at Anne's Data, and he's based at Samri in South Australia. Um, and Shyam, um, we're really looking forward to hearing you talk. Thank you. Oh, thanks for that, Nikki. So. As you all listened to Nikki's talk, uh, she went from a consumer to do starting PhD uh, in this field. But uh, my way is the other way around. I, I was a PhD student and now I'm a project officer in terms of consumer engagement. Uh, my story really started in 2009 when I landed in Australia and started my master's in nanotech at Flinders. And then in 2010, I was diagnosed with chronic kidney disease. Uh, but uh, since then, I had my uh, I was on hemodialysis for a couple of years, and then I went back to India to have my transplant. And in 2016, I was fortunate enough to have a, a kidney donor transplant in India, and it's been four years. And I finished my PhD as well, and I was um, involved uh, as a volunteer in uh, BCKD projects. Uh, I'm a, a member of the National Kidney Consumer Council at KHA, so. Uh, my passion is to advocate uh, not only the researchers uh, how to do the research by involving consumers, but also uh, I want to empower the consumers from being a, a normal consumer and how to be involved in these research activities. So as you all see, there are different stages of consumer engagement which are often portrayed uh, in a clinical trial way or how to involve consumer in an efficient way. Uh, we don't want to be in level zero, which is no engagement, and we want to move from a level zero to level three, which is the consumer-led, which are uh, the few examples you have seen from Nikki, and I'm going to talk about myself, and then Chandana and Chaman, they're going to talk their stories. 
So level zero or information is like, when I was diagnosed, there were, way, uh, and when there were people come to me and then they ask, uh, or they don't, there will be uh, flyers on the web, um, uh, outpatient board, you see, okay, this is the research that's happening. So that's the level zero, which is you just inform the consumer what's happening, which is uh, taking a patient as a tokenistic approach. And in terms of consultation, I was given a um, few uh, materials to give feedbacks and other stuff, uh, like as a consumer, what uh, feedback I can give. So it's just a one way approach uh, rather than a bi-directional approach when you're in a consulting, consulting phase. We want to move from there to involving consumers more. And uh, the level, uh, the ideal level is to be collaborating with consumers to co-produce uh, with the consumers, the information that you wanted. And the golden standard, I call it as an empowered consumers. So this is the, these uh, projects are directed and run by the consumers for the consumers. That's how we want to move from an information perspective to an empowered consumer. And my story is really one of the, uh, if you call racks to riches story, because I became a consumer and how as an, from a consumer information and how I became an empowered consumer through Ant's data, which is when you look at Ant's data as a registry, those are the guys uh, behind numbers. They have, they deal with numbers all day in and day out and there is not a really any patient involvement, but to make a consumer like me to be an empowered consumer is really an eye opener for the other researchers and other registries involved in this space. So one of the early uh, collaborative projects, as I said earlier, is about how to uh, how I came about. So as you all know, Anstata produces annual reports each year, and those are very specific for clinicians and researchers. And it's a 200 page long document. You can go to the website and then download it. And there are a lot of information for clinicians and those information, it's hard to filter out what as a consumer, when I was diagnosed, how to get or uh, what uh, information I needed to get a whole landscape of kidney disease in Australia. So the first uh, thing were myself and the BHC KD Consumer Advisory Board worked along with uh, Emily Duncanson, who is a, a project officer as well, was to uh, develop this infographic where those 200 page document is filtered out into a one page infographic. So this is a long process, but it is a must uh, process for a consumer to disseminate the information in a way where they can understand all that are presented, uh, all, the, all the data that's been collected by the uh, renal registry like ANS data and how to inform the consumer in a way where they can understand how many people are getting transplant, how many people are in dialysis. So this is a bi-directional process. As I told you earlier, we involved, they involved the consumer. There is a huge group of consumers. First we sat out and then we, we picked what topics we want to see as a consumer rather than researchers saying, this is what you got. So that's a real uh, um, uh, phase where uh, researchers working collaboratively with consumers. And also we, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's just, just not one infographic and there's going to be a video on the same thing. So it's not just we are sticking to one format. We are catering for all audience with multiple format from infographic to a YouTube video where consumer can go to the website and start our website and see that uh, information. And the one I'm currently working on is um, developing a summary for patients and the public, which is going to be a plain language summary. As you heard from Fiona earlier from the UK Renal Registry, the patient facing documents or the plain language summaries are really important to get more detailed information about kidney disease in Australia and New Zealand. So Anstara produces uh, different reports each year and uh, some of them are specific for hospitals, some of them are specific for researchers, but uh, we are in a plan now to execute uh, the, um, the, take the report, the annual report, and then transform them into a patient specific uh, summary report, which is uh, not small, not like an infographic, but not uh, hugely like an annual report. So we want to have a balance of what information needed to be presented so that uh, as a consumer, you will have an empowered knowledge and also uh, you have this information available to you when you are newly diagnosed or if you want to look at the numbers across the uh, Australia and New Zealand. 
So what I call it as a must report. Uh, so what we have to do in terms of this one is the must, um, it's, it should make an impact uh, among the kidney consumers and it should be a user friendly report and it should be specific for what information they want from a report and which has to be templated like other reports that are produced by An Anstara you should have a template so that we don't have to spend more time in investing to produce this report every year. So that as soon as they release an annual report, we can get a consumer specific report as well. It's a hard um, task, but I think it is a must start so that we can keep this momentum going in terms of engaging consumers and also uh, producing these kind of consumer specific plain language summaries. And the process flow for producing this consumer plain language summaries, I just reviewed the whole ANS data report for that year. And then I extracted key points, what as a consumer I want to see from those chapters. So we have like 10 chapters ranging from the state of dialysis uh, till the pediatric uh, uh, information. And then also we developed those uh, glossary for key terms, like as you researchers know, there are all these jargons which we do want to be simply um, uh, used in a simple language for the consumer to understand. So that will be developed uh, by me and the other consumers as well. How to represent, say, for example, Katie Ghost came up with saying, we can't use renal, so we are moving to kidney replacement therapy. And even uh, um, AK uh, autosomal or uh, how to define polycystic kidney disease, how to define EGFR. So those are the glossaries we have to develop. And then I presented the key points using uh, images and infographics and graph in a visually appealing way and also uh, not just a boring pie chart or an Excel line chart. So uh, how to uh, uh, present the data in a patient specific way. And then I draft a, um, a version of the consumer report and then send it to the broader consumer advisory board because in a consumer world, we don't want to uh, ex include just one patient. So minimum one patient, maximum N number. So, so we should at least have one patient in your consumer board and, uh, and, and the more number is good. So that's why we have to send it to a broader consumer advisory board. And then we have to get their opinion and feedback and also finalize it and then disseminate the reports, not only through the Anstara website, but like KHA website, the BHCKD network where people can go and look at these plain language summaries and also have an idea. So now I move from an uh, involved and collaborative phase to an empowered phase. So this one uh, was uh, slightly touched by Nikki in her presentation about the National Strategic Action Plan by Kidney Health Australia. So this is the new project that we are forging ahead for to pick up the activities from the BCKD Consumer Advisory Board. So we want to break those silos and then we have to work cohesively together from now on to improve the consumer participation. So this grant is provided under the Public Health and Chronic Disease Program and it aligns with the KHS National Strategic Action Plan, which is to uh, be, have a consumer network. So the network of consumers from all over Australia and also they will be an empowered consumer at the end of this project. And the key objectives for the consumer, uh, the network uh, is to establish a national kidney consumer research network, at least of 20 consumers from various uh, expertise and various stages of their kidney disease. And also we have to provide pathways for the consumers to produce um, research across participating programs from priority setting through the implementation. So in the whole of research cycle, we have to include the consumer from every step from the priority setting till the implementation. And also we have to develop a one-stop shop for the consumers to go and get educated on how to be, uh, how to produce these reports or how to be involved in a research, uh, those kind of things. We have to host that on a website. So that's a main thing for both, not only for the consumers, but also for a researcher, when you research and how to involve consumer in your research. So those are the things we have to develop and also support, as Nikki mentioned, the support of um, research officers or research buddies are really important in uh, when you're engaging with consumers because we all have a lived experience. We have a story to tell, but how do you support us in providing what we need in terms of training 
to transfer that lived experience, the soft skill set or the soft skill set we carry into an uh, actionable one. So that's the support is critical for uh, consumer engagement work. And also we, we have to disseminate this information and also by doing some workshop, there will be a lot of, uh, we are hoping to do a lot of virtual workshops for how to um, disseminate the research that's across to the consumers so that consumer will have an idea and have a say whether that research is really helpful for them. So uh, the whole uh, look will be like um, the four pillars that are already in the beach CKD embedded in the beach CKD will be there, but we will have to work towards the, those four pillars to have the consumer group so that each pillar can go to the consumer group and then they can empower them, they can get the resources, they can teach them. And, but we all uh, work uh, in cohesion, not in a silo. So the information sharing across those pillars is gonna be more enriched with the network formation. So we have a nucleus of people where myself, Nikki and other project officer will drive these four pillar consumer network. And we'll engage uh, with other stakeholders like the public uh, to how to disseminate that information from the network to the public space. So I, I know there will be a lot of researchers asking the question, Sham, now you told the story, how to involve these consumers in my research, because as a researcher, it is really critical to think about consumer engagement and how to involve consumers. So the top three tips I'm gonna leave you with are set clear expectations, uh, mentorship and funding. So what I mean by that is when you have a set clear uh, expectation, say for example, if you have a, have a project, you have to break down into chunk. And then when you send out to a consumer group, you have to tell us how much uh, time it will be, uh, we, you need from a consumer to work on that project. So I think um, Stephen presented the Anstata uh, consumer work, uh, the table from yesterday where you can see that projects are broken down into simpler steps so that consumer can have an idea what the project is about and how much time I can spend instead of just saying like, I just want to work you on this one so that uh, we, you have a, a smaller um, goals to achieve so that we can go back to the consumer and then say, okay, you're gonna work on this part. It will need at least 40 minutes each week for the next two months. Are you happy to work? So that we have an idea about whether we can, because um, most of the consumers are also battling their diseases. So you have to take in mind, it's, uh, we, they are volunteering their time and um, their valuable uh, skill set. So it's mostly, it has to be done with uh, the researcher. And I talked about the mentorship and the research buddies. As we all came um, uh, on board on a consumer engagement, it's critical for a research buddy to transform or to translate our skill set into an uh, action. So that's where the research buddies come in. So in my area, I work closely with uh, Emily Duncanson. So she helped me. So this uh, to and fro information. So there is a person that can hear what I want to do because when uh, as a consumer, sometimes you'll be frustrated why there is no uh, 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 voice, my voice is not being heard. So the, uh, the dedicated person that's sitting there is your research buddy who can go back to the research buddy and if they, they feel you at ease, they can uh, help you to uh, transfer your skills. That's the main thing. And also the mentoring and workshops. So for consumers, we have other uh, skills as well. So these workshops and trainings helps us to adapt to the uh, nephrology research we want. At the end of the day, money matters because if you want to involve consumers, you have to critically think and uh, how much you are gonna spend because if you, if you think consumer as a, a source of or base of the research, so you have to invest just more than parsley because what I say in that means like, when you want to involve a consumer throughout the research cycle, it's gonna be expensive and it is uh, good to plan ahead how I'm gonna involve consumer in what capacities so that I'm not taking a tokenistic approach to involve consumers so that I'm in, empowering a consumer at the end of the day. And also it's a two way street. So as I said earlier, money matters, but my, to do that thing, you have to have a definite a project outline, have a, a buddy and then involve consumers. When you're writing a grant, make sure 
it's like funding for any other lab equipment. So same way you should treat consumer as a necessary expense. And an acknowledgement, as I said, uh, when I moved into this space, it's uh, really hard, but uh, there are a lot of people who made me at ease in this role. I would really like to thank the Beach CKD pillars, uh, Kidney Health Australia, and Professor Stephen McDonald for his amazing work on the Anstella registry part. And the registry staff made me welcome in their group, so which is really good when you are from a different uh, field and you more want to move into a, a research uh, in an, into a registry space. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Sean. That's fantastic. Um, we've got one quick question, which is probably all we've got time for, so that we could, we've got two more speakers to go. So thank you so much for giving um, us all the information about Anne's data and your work there. Um, Amanda um, has just asked us around policymakers, and she was wondering, has any consideration been given to developing a policy version of the relevant reports produced by any of the pillars? Uh, we ideally want to translate these uh, guidelines or reports into policies and that's where, as you mentioned, Amanda, Chris uh, from uh, Kidney Health Australia and also our clinical director, Dr. Shilpa J. Sudarsan, who sits on these beach security committees come in handy because when people wear multiple hats, they can translate these researchers into policies because at the end of the day, uh, the money sits with the politicians and as you said, Chris is going to do a blood test on them. Uh, hopefully that makes more impact on the uh, uh, politicians when they see how many of them are risk, at risk of chronic kidney disease. But I think uh, when we develop these uh, documents for consumers, I think it will translate into a policy through KHA and other advocacy groups. Thank you so much, John. Oh, sorry, that was me. <laughs> um, are you introducing the next one, Sham? Or is that me? No, no, I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna go and uh, introduce Dr. Shamain Green. Shamain Green is the manager at uh, PKD Australia and works to support the foundation in their primary objectives to connect, support, educate, and advocate for Australians and their families affected by PKD. Diagnosed with ADPKD at the age of seven, Shamain brings a personal experience living with kidney disease to motivate and inform her work at PKD Australia and participate as a consumer partner in research, serving as a member of the BCKD Consumer Advisory Board. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shamain Green. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks Shyam. Uh, so I've been asked to share my story today. I don't have any slides, so I hope you can follow along. And I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to present today. I would like to acknowledge the Garingai people who are the traditional custodians of the land I am on and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. When I was a young child, I was diagnosed with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. There was a 50% chance that I would inherit this genetic condition that affected my grandfather, father, and sister. And as I grew up, my special kidneys were simply a fact of life. And healthy living has been a big part of growing up, eating lots of fruit and vegetables and fish, and keeping very active with soccer, swimming, and fishing. And I was sent to school with a large Fred Flintstone drink bottle from Sydney Wonderland, if anyone remembers that place and ordered to drink the whole thing. So this usually resulted in me tipping out its contents because it made me need to go to the bathroom a lot. And as a child, that was really inconvenient. Fast forward 20 years, and I'm now a patient on the Prevent ADPKD clinical trial, which is otherwise known as the water trial. Uh, that's looking at whether drinking the right amount of water can prevent the progression um, to kidney failure in ADPKD. I'm currently prescribed 2.5 litres a day, and it will be amazing if the results of the study are positive, as water is a cheap, safe, and effective treatment, um, if it's found to be so, and is something really positive that the patient can do to gain control over disease 
but until recently, the only treatment was kidney transplant and dialysis. For many people in the early stages of PKD, they are told not to worry yet, that dialysis is a long way off, but in truth, they are worrying and it is important to offer psychosocial care. It is scary for me thinking about the future, the thought that my kidney function will one day decline and that I might need a transplant or that it might shorten my life. My family didn't tell me at a young age what it actually meant to have ADPKD, so I never really understood the full implications when I was a child. And I was shielded from these things when my, father, when my grandfather passed away. I was four and he had been sick for a long time. He had had a kidney transplant and was on many medications and had serious side effects. And it got to the stage where he didn't want to be a burden anymore. And my dad felt strongly that it was the medications that made my granddad so sick and it fueled his distrust in the medical system. And as a means of control over his own health, he really avoided doctor's appointments and didn't medicate his high blood pressure. When I was a teenager, he suffered an aortic aneurysm, which is a rare but devastating complication of PKD and high blood pressure. This weakness and bulging in the wall of his largest artery was life-threatening and the surgeons managed to do incredible surgery and saved his life. And since then, he has been taking his blood pressure medication um, and looking after himself too. For me, apart from bouts of urinary tract infections and an incredibly painful infection of a cyst and occasional stabbing pains, I don't believe PKD has stopped me living a normal life. When you have PKD, you're in it for the long haul. And from the outside, people with PKD look like everyone else. And probably this forms part of the reason so many people don't often talk to others about this disease. For me, I look healthy and I want others to think of me as a healthy person and escape the stigma of having a chronic disease. I was always drawn to science um, and that's probably one of the reasons I joined the Beat CG. KD advisory, um, sorry, committee. And throughout my bachelor degree in medical science, I found a passion for embryo development and the messaging that occurs within cells. So I completed my PhD in cell signaling in the embryo and during implantation. After my PhD, I began working as an embryologist in a fertility clinic and enjoyed working with patients on their IVF journeys. I was faced by the option myself to undergo IVF and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, in which fertilized embryos are tested for PKD and embryos that are diagnosed as free of the disorder are placed in the uterus with the intent to initiate a pregnancy. Ultimately, my husband and I decided this wasn't right for us. Now, the hardest time for me in this journey was when my son was diagnosed with PKD at six weeks of age. He had been really sick with a urinary tract infection and they thought that this had spread. When we did the ultrasound for his kidneys, we found cysts and also what they think is nephrocalcinosis, um, deposits of calcium in the kidneys, but we're still quite unsure about this. Um, so after my son's diagnosis, I changed direction and it was through my dad that I was introduced to Robert Gardos, Chair of PKD Australia, where I've been working now for nearly three years. I work at PKD Australia to support the foundation in their primary objectives to connect, support and educate through curating seminars, webinars and education materials and to advocate for Australians and their families affected by PKD. I feel a responsibility to help raise awareness and find answers for those affected by PKD. I like to think that my personal experiences living with PKD will provide unique insights and inform my work at PKD Australia and as a member of the BEAT CKD Consumer Advisory Board. My goal is to keep the patient front and center of mind throughout my work and I try to draw from a wide range of patient experiences rather than just my own. It is so important to be informed by a diverse range of patient experiences and I am learning every day and I'm so grateful to the CKD community who have shared their experiences with me and banded with us for advocacy, support and education.
I was introduced to Beat CKD through my role at PKD Australia, and it was an exciting opportunity to be able to partner with clinicians and researchers to work to achieve better health outcomes for patients and to be moving away from the traditional system where the patient has a minimal role in their diagnosis and treatment. After seeing the difficulties my granddad suffered with his health and the risks of medications, my dad made his own decisions about avoiding treatment and not getting regular health checkups as a means of keeping control. This had serious consequences and my family is lucky my father got a second chance at living. I have been very involved in the decision-making process when it comes to my health and being able to advocate for my own health has been so crucial and an important aspect of my care. And as you've heard throughout the meeting, uh, I am the expert on me. After experiencing late onset preeclampsia with my first pregnancy, I had the discussion with my nephrologist during my second pregnancy whether to start an aspirin therapy. We decided against it. However, the decision was shared and carefully considered. I did again develop late onset preeclampsia in my second pregnancy. I had spots in my vision and my blood work wasn't ideal. I was told that labor needed to be induced and I really wanted the birth to be as natural as possible without induction. Even though I consider myself to be quite educated in things concerning my health, I had the wrong information and this was a barrier that we had to overcome at this time. I had been informed during a pregnancy class that induction of labor would increase my chances of needing a cesarean. However, if my pregnancy was to continue, I would have been a candidate for an emergency cesarean with potential risks for me and my baby. And I am so, so glad the doctor on duty took the time to explain the benefits and harms of the decisions I needed to make. And my beautiful daughter was born on September 4, which funnily enough is also PKD Awareness Day. So I've got a, a lot of busy years ahead. The BEAT CKD Research Forum has highlighted the value of sharing information between researchers, clinics, clinicians and patients and vice versa and encourages open discussions between patients and clinicians, meaning patients are less likely to, have, to be passive and able to make a more active role in their health journey. Two specific projects that I am involved with through Beat CKD and the Pregnancy and Parenthood in CKD project, um, sorry, is the Pregnancy and Parenthood in CKD project with Pro Professor Shilpa Jessadasan and Dr. Arandi Hiwawasan. I was drawn to the Pregnancy and Parenthood in CKD project both as a former embryologist and as a CKD patient who has gone through preeclampsia and having to make difficult decisions around parenthood. I have seen so many women and men on their journeys to try and become parents. Having children is such a deep desire for so many people and facing fertility issues, whether or not they are due to CKD, is hard. As part of this project, I have joined working groups where we discuss the experiences we have had in order to inform research surrounding the attitudes of health professionals towards pregnancy and CKD in the hope that candid and early discussions take place where patients receive the information they want in the way that they want. The second project I am on is the Impede Clinical Trial as a Consumer Representative. And you may have heard the fantastic news that Associate, Pro Associate Professor Andrew Mallet and his team of researchers have just been awarded federal funding to run the IMPEDE trial investigating metformin and its role in ADPKD. I was introduced to this project when I first started at PKD Australia and we um, can definitely see why Andrew calls this project a labour of love and it has been great to see this project develop over the years as treatments for PKD are so desperately needed. Being part of the Beat CKD community has been a fantastic way to connect with other people on the CKD journey and share our stories. It has been a great opportunity to give back and get involved and stay up to date on the latest research in CKD and I am very hopeful for the future. Thank you everyone for listening.
Thank you so much, Charmaine. That was just amazing um, to hear your story and to share such personal um, steps from your family and for that journey. And, and I, I remember meeting you in Sydney and, and you provided me with some amazing information about PKD that I could bring home to the, the guys in Armidale who had never really seen that or heard other people's stories with it. So thank you for all that you do. Have we got any questions? Um, oh, I can see a question up here. From um, Jonathan. Yep. Um, can I ask where your decision making re tolvaptin? Yes. So um, at the moment, I am not currently eligible for tolvaptin because my kidney function is, is fine at the moment. Um, in the future, that will likely change. So at present, um, being a, a busy mum of two, I wouldn't take Tolvaptin at the moment because of the need to go to the bathroom a lot. As I mentioned, um, that was a problem for me in childhood. And um, it, just is a, it just makes things a little bit tricky. Um, even being on the water trial, I, I do wake up throughout the night and, um, and I, I need to try and balance when I'm, when I'm drinking the water. So I think in the future, it's definitely something I will consider. Um, and I, I, I've heard that it can give you a, a, like push out your kidney function for, you know, a few extra years. And that, that's really important. Um, so definitely in the future and when my lifestyle has changed, I would consider that. Thank you so much for that. Have we got any others? I just thank you. And yeah, I just want to reiterate, thank you so much for sharing so many personal details. It's um, just fantastic to hear. And then how you've translated all that experience into your work within the research setting. So thank you so much thank for you. all the work. Thank you. Um, our next and uh, final speaker for the session, but certainly not our least, is um, a, a good friend of mine, Chandana Guha, who um, is going to be here today uh, talking about all things CARA guidelines. Um, Chandana is currently a consumer rep um, and research assistant at the Centre for Kidney Research, um, and she's a trained statistician. She's fantastic at all the things that I'm not very good at. It's amazing. Um, and she's her, her, she has been a carer of her daughter who uh, received a transplant at the age of 11, um, and Chandana and Dana is currently working with um, Kari and AKTN and as I said on the goal and the NavKids2 trial. Thanks Chandana and welcome. Thanks Nikki. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, all good. Cool, thank you. Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of this area, the dark people, and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Today, I will be talking about my um, involvement in, in writing the CARI guidelines. It's been wonderful to hear the presentations over the last two days and hear consumer stories. Um, the growing consumer engagement in research activities is really, really wonderful. And um, uh, I've been part of uh, two CARI, gui uh, CARI guidelines. Um, I've, written, I've been part of the consumer guidelines for renal biopsy and the COVID-19 consumer evidence summary for kidney and kidney pancreas transplant recipients. They were really wonderful experiences. And I would really like to talk to you about the two pieces of work. Um, so a little bit about the history. Sorry, I'll just go back. I'd like to take you through a little bit of the history of consumer involvement in CARI. Um, the first consumers were involved in, uh, uh, in 2009. A little bit of an involvement happened even before that. There was a committee member in, in the steering. Um, uh, uh, the steering group had a, had a consumer member but with very little input uh, at that point of time. We had uh, in 2011, the first consumer reviewed guidelines. And in 2017, we saw the first consumer friendly version, uh, the first ADPKD guidelines 
that had considerable amount of uh, consumer input, but was not consumer led. The first members of, um, sorry, my computer is really playing up. Okay. Last year in February, 2019, we saw the first two members of the Kari office, that was Nikki and myself, we wrote the uh, consumer uh, biopsy guidelines and then within one year in May 2020, we had the second consumer led guideline on the Kari, uh, sorry, the, the COVID-19 guidelines and we were a group of six. It was a great experience. The two guidelines were completely different. Uh, the experience was different, the situations were different and the topics were different. The uh, the biopsy guidelines, we kicked that off with focus groups in 2019 to determine consumer priorities. There were two writers, Nikki and, and myself, and this was voluntary work for us. So we sort of uh, really took our time. We explored the way we wrote the guidelines because we didn't have any strict deadlines. We were experimenting and uh, it took a while for us to determine what the whole writing process would look like, what the end product would look like, and we went back and forth in refining the documents. We decided first to start um, to have a four page information guide that would incorporate all the, all the, the feedback from the, from the focus groups. And then we thought uh, it would be good to have a one page summary and then of course we felt, oh, we did need an infographic that would be fantastic to have. Ultimately, we had three documents. So it did take a bit of time, 11 months to come up with it. Uh, but of course we, we, we were experimenting and with everything starting from formatting to language, uh, to layout. So, so we really had, uh, um, uh, we took our time with that. It was reviewed by the steering committee. While writing the COVID guidelines, the, the COVID-19 guidelines for transplant recipients, we had had a lot of experience by then from writing the, the biopsy guidelines. We involved six, uh, six consumers and we were also joined by Jermaine who had just compiled the clinical guidelines that were our blueprint. We had in our writing group one member from the steering committee. Um, we had um, Anne's data representative, Sham. We had someone from Sachs Institute, Amanda, from Transplant Australia. Um, uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had a member. So it was a very consultative process where every writer was across every edit. The timelines were really tight. And we literally gave ourselves two weeks to uh, finish the tasks. And that included writing, designing, formatting, editing, and then proofreading. So it was really, really quick. We wanted to get something out there as there was simply nothing. And as consumers, we knew how important it was to, to get some information out there because each one of us was struggling to get information on COVID-19. We didn't know what precautions to take. We didn't know how, how to, uh, uh, you know, what was right and what was wrong in terms of social distancing, how to access health services. So all that was very, very confusing. It was very confronting it as well. So we knew the need to produce something, come up with something quick and have it out there. This is what it looked like, uh, just a one page summary. We uh, had um, input from our six members. We also had, uh, uh, we, we really struggled with, uh, with what sort of information to include and exclude as there was, there was nothing out there uh, that was uh, evidence-based. Uh, so we, uh, so, so that was one of our really big struggles. What worked? Um, lived experience was important, definitely in molding the clinical guidelines to make it consumer friendly. Uh, the diversity of experience when while writing the, the uh, COVID-19 guidelines, we had six members. So the diversity of experience was critical. The team member, members of six, uh, six of us who wrote the second guidelines, comprised of donors, of carers, and recipients. So we had rich transplant related experience. But additionally, we also had diverse life experiences, work experiences. We all came from different backgrounds, different careers, we had different talents, and we were able to forge those relationships that are critical for a team to be productive. And uh, the team worked seamlessly and in a collaborative manner. 
thinking of the overall good of the patients and the effectiveness of the guidelines. So we had that vision in place where we really wanted something for the benefit of the consumers because we knew how much each of us struggled. And uh, once the project was over, uh, I went back and um, uh, we went back to the, to the writers to see what they had to say about their, their writing, ex their experience. And uh, this is what they had to say. Um, these are the writers. We had Nikki, we had uh, Jane, Julie from Transform Australia, Amanda, Shyam, and myself. And what they said, Julie said, I very much appreciated the opportunity to work with such a positive and knowledgeable group of individuals. Uh, of course, we worked over Zoom, so virtual connections helped us to save time and travel and also the ability to have a diverse opinion really worked well. Uh, Amanda said the team was generous and worked well together. Uh, we were supported by great leadership. We had a lot of other comments coming, but, but these are representative and today there's really no time to go through all of them. So apologies, Jane, I couldn't include your comments, but they were really, really valuable. So we went back and saw how we uh, performed against um, the Kari model of engagement. So if you look at, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this model. So if you look at the top two tiers of the pyramid, uh, in, in case of both the biopsy guidelines, as well as the COVID-19 guidelines, we did really well. We had uh, in the steering committee, um, uh, two or more consumers in each case. Uh, in the, the our writing groups, of course, the first writing group was was had two members, and the second writing group had six members. So that we did that well as well. Uh, we did that well, and uh, there was across the board involvement uh, in in both it, uh, it, it, throughout the throughout the the writing process. However, when we come to the third tier, we we sort of involved uh, the consumers to get their feedback through focus groups. And, um, but in case of the COVID-19 guidelines, we just did not have enough time to get the feedback, to run focus groups and get ideas. So, uh, because we had, to, we had to produce something really, really quickly. So, uh, but there were six of us in the writing group with plenty of experience to draw, draw from, and we did come up with some great ideas. The last tier, if you look at the last tier where we, where we thought we had to invite feedback from consumer networks on the final product, that is something we have to improve on. I must admit, we haven't really done very well. Uh, so going forward, that is an op opportunity that we want to pick up and we really want to road test each of our products well. So, what are the tips for next time? What am I going to do well next time? We definitely do need to road test widely. Uh, we need to have a good updating process in place um, uh, because different guidelines fit different situations. So in case of the car, in case of the, the biopsy guidelines, we updated that because we had a change in logo. But we are really struggling with the COVID-19 guidelines, as everyone knows. Um, things are changing, the information is changing. We don't really know what is, there is nothing certain about, uh, about COVID-19 and the documents, uh, uh, to keep a document updated is really challenging. Uh, so what we have decided is to update the COVID-19 guidelines for transplant recipients uh, on a monthly basis uh, with information that is current at the time of updating. Also, the other thing that um, uh, I know Chris and a few, of our, a few of the other speakers spoke about is partnership of, and collaboration in research. I found that uh, with research, as Shyam mentioned, there was on one, uh, you know, there was a researcher led sort of study that uh, uh, and research activities that can happen. And of course, we can have a completely consumer led um, uh, study and uh, research activity. But what I find is a partnership is works the best. And when we have a partnership, and when we have a group of people working together, as with any teams, we need to have autonomy and flexibility, of course, but we do need to have set boundaries, set expectations, 
that are that are in, put in place right at the start. And so that's where we 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 need to talk about terms of references and boundaries. So that is something we really need to do well next time. Uh, what really benefited us was having Jermaine on board at every meeting for. Uh, the COVID-19 guidelines because with Jermaine we were able to quickly have a check with her and make sure that we had our information correctly nutted down uh, so that sort of speeded up the process and, uh, and of course a conflict resolution is important because uh, each one of us are different our ideas are different uh, and we need to have a place where we can really talk about our differences and then come to a consensus and um, what are my takeaways from this uh, experience? I think leadership is the key. Nikki was a fantastic leader in the way she ran uh, each meeting. Um, uh, the partnership with researchers are critical um, because without, I think we spoke a lot about consumer engagement, but what I would like to say is Consumers can't exist without researchers. We need you. So the researchers are the voice that consumers can have. The other thing that I realized while writing the Kari guidelines is that we are more than our, uh, we are way more than our disease. Um, as consumers, sometimes we get stuck into, uh, 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 stuck into thinking that the disease is just our life and suddenly uh, with this uh, opportunity to contribute to writing gu the guidelines, I realized that I had a lot more to offer that wasn't just focused on the disease. Sometimes we lose that confidence uh, when we are amidst uh, other researchers because we don't understand the strengths that we have. What I realized that as I went through my transplant journey with my daughter, I unconsciously sort of absorbed lots of information, lots of experience and that sat deep down and it all came out when we, uh, we when I was given this opportunity to, to take part in this research activity. So that realization was lovely and the confidence that my team uh, uh, inculcated in me was also great. Communication is the key. We need to be clear about acronyms, jargons, and also acknowledge uh, the ideas that other consumers have. Uh, we've talked about training and having a buddy system. Uh, I definitely support that. Uh, when I came on board, I was um, um, I, I really uh, struggled to understand the different terminology. Uh, research terminology is really very specific, and that's. I struggled a bit over there and it was always good to have a buddy, but I, I think at Kari, the team was wonderful in the way they supported me uh, and they were my buddies uh, through my research activities. So I'd like to thank everyone, uh, each one of my Kari team members for supporting me through, these, through writing these guidelines. And of course, managing conflict and expectations. I've spoken about that before. That's also a key takeaway. And uh, yes, I will not keep you much more. I know I, we're sort of running out of time. So thank you very, very much for listening to me. Thanks, Chandana. That was a really nice presentation. And I'm sure the audience will appreciate spending 20, uh, the extra time to hear those powerful stories from you, Charmaine and um, uh, Nikki. I have a question for you from Kelly. How many First Nations representatives are part of the writing groups, either biopsy or COVID guideline? Oh, we, uh, all of us were from Australia. So she talking about the um, indigenous people. No, we didn't have, uh, um, Nicole, would you want to take that uh, question? Nikki? Um, no, Kelly, we, unfortunately for those groups, we didn't have any, um, but it's certainly the plan at the moment. We're uh, working with a couple of uh, in, uh, Indigenous um, young girls who are on hemodialysis to look at um, them coming on to the current guidelines to help with all future ones, but also with the Indigenous guidelines as well. So yeah, that, that was definitely um, our flaw um, and that's something going forward we need to, uh, we are addressing at the moment. So yeah. Yeah, agree. Thanks. 
Thanks, Chandana and Nikki. Do, if you don't have any further questions, let's thank all our presenters today. That's been really wonderful to hear those powerful stories. And it's not only the stories that makes us special, but the skill set they provide these patient partners uh, in bringing them uh, up to date with the research skill. And I want to thank all the CAs for empowering our consumers uh, to be a powerful advocates, not only in terms of uh, promoting research, but also ways to incorporate us in your projects. This beach CKD work is really pioneer in setting consumer engagement in kidney health uh, among Australia. So I'm really thankful for all the beach CKD investigators to make us an empowered consumer. And, uh, and we are an example that uh, we can't go back. This is the new normal. And if you are not involving researchers, you have to pick up your game. And let's not undo the work in in terms of involving consumers because of COVID. We'll keep ahead and going. Uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. And our next.